Yes, who had their hands up? Santiago. Um, unfortunately, I'm unable to meet you on my end, but I think you're from North Texas, so if you'd like, you could, um, well, you can ask your question. Go ahead, Santiago. Okay, um, uh, a, a, a student a student asked me a question um, in in similar to that and what he did is he actually took a picture with his uh, with his phone of his homework so if you if you can do that and send the pictures to me um, I, I will definitely accept it that way okay, thank you. you're quite welcome okay so um, so let's go on to the third declension and okay. yes. Who has a question? Yeah, this is Michael. Um, so with the homework, um, are they showing up in some Moodle on your side? Um, well, no, because I don't have an actual link. Oh, do you mean like the passage readings? Well, usually um, my site, I go under site keys and click on calendar. Okay. And everything shows up, but I haven't been seeing any. It's not just your class. It's actually a lot of. Classes. Oh really? Um, like the actual like alert that'll say like on this day it'll be like a different color and yeah have to look. yeah. Uh, I actually haven't. I never I never saw assignments that way. Um, so I haven't personally. But um, uh, but because of the fact that I don't really actually have a link on my Smoodle for you to turn in your homework into Smoodle, I'm expecting them via email. The only one that has that does something that does you have a option to submit to Smoodle are the passage readings only. Oh. Okay. All right. Cool. So um, let's talk about the third declension. Like I said, there's three different types of declensions, and what is a declension? Uh, just for the sake of review, a declension is a pattern of inflection, or when um, when a word changes. When a word changes, um, the closest the closest uh, equivalent to that that parallels that to the English language is uh, pluralization. Um, there's some words where all you need to do is add an s at the end of the word to make it plural, like a like a, a book or a microphone. You just simply add an s to that, and you pluralize the word. But then there's other words where you have to actually change the word to pluralize it. For example, man. Um, there's one man, but if there's more than one man, we have to change that A to an E to make it men, right? Or children. Children is the plural form for child. So there's, those, are, those are particular patterns of change. And that's what a declension is. It's a particular pattern of change. And, um, and this third declension personally um, is I'm not a good I'm, I, I don't really like the third declension because this one has the most change compared to the first and second declension okay hence the reason why I call this first declension um, the junkyard declension okay um, the reason being I call the junkyard declension is because the difficulty with this declension is identifying the stem because often the stem is hidden in the third declension. The stem is hidden in the third declension. Okay? And what is the stem? The stem is the part of the noun that rarely changes when you have these inflections, right? So it's the thing that remains. It's the thing that 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 um that is preserved, if you will. Okay? So that is the stem. And it's the noun ending that changes. But when we have the third declension, um, sometimes the pure stem gets hidden with the third declension, and um, that's what makes the third declension and identifying it very difficult. Um, so uh, um, the solution to that, in order to find the third declension, is is this. And give me one second, you guys. Here's the solution. Step one, locate or identify the genitive singular form. Locate or identify the genitive singular form, okay? 
And then once you find the genitive singular, the next thing you do is remove the form ending. And when I mean form ending, I'm rem I, I say the noun ending. Remove the noun ending. And once you remove the noun ending of the genitive, that's when you have, that's when you actually have the, uh, the, the pure third declension form. The pure third declension. Okay? Yes, go ahead. When you say the pure form, are you talking about the stem? Is that what you mean? That's what I mean. Yes, ma'am. May I continue on? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, cool. So the next slide is a chart. And um, we're going to come across a lot of charts today, so please bear with us. But the next slide is a chart of the third declension. Now, what characterizes the third declension um, in regards to their stems is this. The stem, the noun stems of the third declension will always end in a consonant. Okay? That's what makes the third declension the third declension, when the noun stem ends in a consonant. Okay? So just please keep that in mind. So whenever I say stem here on our chart, yes, you're absolutely right because I did not turn them on. So thank you for reminding me. So um, you know what? I'm going to revert back to my former slide so you guys can all write down the notes that I have uh, right here, okay? Because it's very unfair of me to... Um, selfishly hide my slides for you guys. So I'm going to offer them to you right now. Josh, can you hear me? Yes, I was just going to say that I will see your slides. Okay, all right, cool. And I'm assuming that's the same with Joseph as well as North Texas? Okay, cool. Unless there is a question from you guys. Is there a question? Okay. Is it still on there? I think Santiago and Ryan, could I have you guys meet yourselves? All right, thank you. And then I'll unmute Trinity as well. Yes, North Texas, go ahead. Did you have a question? Okay. All right. So um, let me continue on to the, your actual chart of the third declension. Um, like I said, what characterizes the nouns of the third declension is this. The noun stems of the third declension end in a consonant, end in a consonant. Okay? Um, so when I say stem here, you guys, just imagine these nouns in the Greek that end in a consonant, okay? And so we need to add a sigma to it. That's the noun ending, all right? You'll notice with the genitive, and I'm going to mark this up right here. You notice with the genitive, there's two different endings, okay? Let me just say this. This one, the Omicron sigma, is the more common third declension ending for the genitive singular, okay? The omega sigma is a rarity. You won't see it a whole lot, okay? It is the omicron sigma that you'll see most times, all right? Um, this dative is an actual dative. It is not a yoda subscript, 
Okay, so we will actually have a yoda at the end of a word when it's the dative singular. Um, the same reason with the genitive. You see the new here. This alpha is more common, okay? The more common ending is the alpha, all right? Again, the same thing for the accusative plural. That alpha sigma is the more common ending. I just wanted to provide these alternatives here um, to let you know that they do exist in the New Testament, but they are the minority, all right? Um, for the nominative plural, all you need to do with the stem is add an epsilon sigma. Then we have for the genitive plural that omega nu. The omega nu is the same thing in all the declensions. So for the genitive plural, you have the same ending for all three declensions. It's that omega nu. All right? And then finally, the dative plural is the sigma yoda. Now check this out, you guys. I have here in parentheses a nu. I have here in the parentheses here a new. Why did I do that? It's because this new sometimes is there and sometimes it's not there. And it's called a movable new, a movable new, all right? The, the best comparison that we have in English is the indefinite article, the indefinite article, okay? So, for example, if I say, a, if, if I say book, the indefinite article is that A in front of it, a book, a microphone, a laptop computer, um, um, let's see, uh, um, a shirt, a t-shirt, okay? So that's the indefinite article. But what do you have to do with the indefinite article when the word begins with a vowel? Does anyone know? And raise your hand if you have the answer. What happens when you what to the indefinite article when you have a word that begins with a vowel like apple, apple or airplane or ex, uh, um, exclamation? You add an n. Very good. Why do we do that? Because in English, in English, we don't like two vowels together. We try to separate them with consonants most often than not. Um, so that's why we add an n when we we add an n to the indefinite article. Excellent. That's exactly right. That's kind of the same idea with the movable new. All right. So you have a movable new only when the word after it begins with a vowel. Okay. If the word doesn't begin with a vowel, then the movable new is not necessary. All right. So that's why I had that there. Sometimes you'll see it. Sometimes you won't because of because of that reasoning. All right. Any questions? Okay, um, let's see, let's see. Now, uh, erase all drawings. So, I want to focus on the nominative singular, okay, and then the dative plural, all right? With these two, with these two noun endings here, the noun endings have a sigma, or they begin with a sigma, as you can see, okay? This is the reason why the stem gets hidden. Because sigma, when it's next to certain consonants, actually changes the consonant. Um, and what happens is they fuse together. They fuse together. And so I'll talk about that and I'll explain that more when we get into it. But um, I just want us to know that the reason why, the reason why we have um, these changes, these difficult changes in the third declension is because of the nominative singular and the dative plural, all right? And so I'm going to continue next in my presentation talking about those things, all right? So may I continue on? Yes? Okay, cool. One second. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, one second? Okay, all right. I will hold on then. Yes, Tony, go ahead. Movable new that that's only added when the word after the word starts in the vowel? That's correct. That's right. Okay, we're good. 
All right, great. So, um, so my next slide is an explanation of what I just shared, but you can actually see it within the presentation. So because of the third declension words end in consonants, funny things happen. And there's no real fancy way of explaining them, just funny things happen, okay? And these funny things occur within the nominative singular and the dative plural form because those noun endings begin with a sigma. Yes, Tony, go ahead. No question? No, sir. Okay. And so basically, these funny things that occur with these particular noun endings, they, there's, there's, there's particular categories of them, and they're known as stop consonants. Um, and I'll talk about those stop consonants next. Um, and I'll, uh, so I'll give you time to finish up writing this explanation here. May I continue on? One second. Okay. Yes, Tony, go ahead. Uh, in, in the third declension to be both all, all male, female, masculine, feminine, and neutral? That's correct, sir. There's, there's masculine words, feminine words, as well as neuter words in the third declension. Another reason why it's so difficult. Hence, another reason why also I call it the junkyard declension, because I feel that the Greek speakers just, whatever word doesn't fit the first and second declension, they just put into one declension known as the third. <laughs> All right, are we good? Yes, thumbs up. Cool. All right, so let's talk about these stops then. Let's talk about the stops and the third declensions. Ignore for a moment what I just did right there. They were supposed to disappear, and um, they didn't. So just don't worry about that right now. But let me explain to you what a stop is. A stop is a consonant whose sound is formed by slowing down or completely stopping the flow of air through the mouth. Okay, that's what a stop is. It obstructs the flow of air when you are um, saying these consonants. And there's three types. There's three types. Excuse me. There's the labials, the velars, and the dentals. Now, the labials, the reason why they're called labials is because the only way that you can pronounce these consonants is by pressing your lips together, pressing your lips together. So labial lip, okay? 
And so it's that puh sound, that puh. You have to uh, press your lips together in order to make the sound of the consonant. So that's labial. Velar, there's something known as a vellum in the back of your throat. Don't ask me what it is specifically. Um, it's like next to the uvula, the punching bag in the back of your throat. But in order to in order to pronounce these consonants, you actually have to have the airflow touch that vellum part of your throat. So that k sound, that k sound, that's what a velar is. Velar, okay. And then the third category is known as the dental, and it's the probably the most obvious of the three because you actually have to touch your tongue with your teeth, with your teeth, and um, and those are those sounds, the t the sounds, and so that is what a dental stop is. So labial, you got to use your lips, velar, back of the throat, dental, your teeth. And it is these three categories of stop consonants that change when interacting with a sigma, okay? I see Leanne just wearing the hat now. It's, it's serious. She's like a pitcher in a baseball game. We're, we're ready to go now, Leanne. I like that. I had to put my... <laughs> All right. So, are we good? May I continue on? Is there any questions for me? All right. So, I'm going to continue on unless otherwise um, someone says so. Speak now, forever hold your peace kind of thing. So, the next slide then that I'm going to show you is actually a chart of these stop consonants and what happens to these stop consonants when you add a sigma to them okay so let's continue on and what we have is the stops when there's a sigma next to these consonants so here are the labials all right here are the labials there's pi or p beta and phi okay so your your labial consonants are pi beta and phi, pi, beta, phi, all right? Now, I didn't add the sigma to them here, but if you go above the chart, so when you have the consonant and the sigma, what happens is the sigma and that labial consonant fuse together. They, they fuse to become one consonant, okay? And that consonant is a pussy, pussy. All right. So you actually kind of under, um, you actually get the grasp of what uh, this consonant change occurs or how this happens. And that's why we have these pussy. The excuse me. That's why we have this pussy consonant. It's the connection of a labial consonant with a sigma. All right. And we have pussy, pussy. Okay. The next categories of stop consonants are the velars, right? And we have three of them. There's kappa, gamma, and ki, or chi, okay? Like I said, you have to pronounce them in the back of your throat. Um, your vellum, again, whatever that is, um, interrupts the airflow, and that's why you have this sound, all right? But when you add a sigma to any of these consonants, they fuse together, and they become a kasi, kasi, all right? Professor? Yes. Pardon me, I'm sorry, but I'm not really understanding. Are you saying that on the, like from the first one, for example, Right. that all of those letters 
sound? Yes, that's correct. That's exactly right. So basically, let me, instead of a highlighter, let me get a pen. So whenever you see a word where there's going to be a change because there's a sigma at the end of these consonants, what happens is that word with the sigma fuse together. They, they, they form to become this one thing, this one thing, and that thing is the pasi. It's like marriage, if you will, you know, uh, especially, you know, the whole idea of biblical marriage, the two become one flesh. That's exactly what's going on here. So whenever you see a sigma with any of these three consonants, um, most likely than not, a change is going to occur, and that change is the pasi. The outcome is the pasi. And that's the same thing with these velars. If you add a sigma next to these velars, and that looks like a data, I apologize, but if you add a sigma to next to these velars, again, they form a kasi. So you won't see the kappa sigma there anymore. It'll just become a kasi. Whoever had that explanation that I just heard, that's exactly right. I confirm it. I approve it. That's, that's, that's what happens. That's what happens. And I'll show you examples of some of them, uh, how this works when, um, uh, when, we, when we do it, okay? Or when I show you the charts and stuff. Any other questions? Okay, and then finally, our dentals, our dentals. Um, there's four of them. There's four dental letters. We have tau, delta, theta, and nu. Tau, delta, theta, and nu, all right? Those are our four dental uh, consonants, and what happens to them is they get freaked out by the sigma. So imagine like the sigma and these dental letters were out on a date and these dentals were freaked out by the sigma. They were just too intimidated by the sigma. So they didn't even have the date. So they, they run away. They run away, if you will. You don't see these consonants anymore and all that remains is that sigma, is that sigma. So that's what I mean when, this, when these dental letters, they drop, they disappear and, um, and then the sigma remains. Yes. I have one question. Is this, is this the middle of the word or at the end of it, or both? It, 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 can, it can be actually both. It can actually be both. But for the sake of the third declension, it's towards the end of the word. All right, may I continue on? Are we good? All right, great. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some examples uh, using third declension words. Now, unfortunately, off the top of my head, um, I don't have a very good example for labials. So we don't have an actual labial third declension word. Um, but do not fret, when we get into uh, the verbs, this actually happens a lot with the verbs, so I'll show you a good example of that um, when we get to the verbs. I'm going to show you an example of a velar as well as a dental, okay? So, um, so th those are the two examples that I'm going to show you today. So I'm going to take a moment to escape um, our presentation and go back to our paradigm chart.
Okay, so I'm going to show you now a I'm going to show you a Velar example. I'm a Velar example. Okay, and the Velar example that I'm going to show you guys, the word is spelled as so sigma, and that's a capitalized sigma. I apologize for that. Sigma alpha rho cosi. Okay, sigma alpha rho cosi. Okay, but remember with third declensions, that is not the stem. That is not the stem because the stem is hidden in the nominative singular, remember? Um, and so I'm going to give you the genitive singular next, which is sigma alpha rho kappa omicron sigma. Okay, sigma alpha rho kappa omicron sigma. Okay. And I'm going to get a different fault uh, uh, font here because I don't like I don't like this font. I'm going to get my favorite font for Greek. Galatia. Okay. And this word in English means flesh. That's what this word means. It means flesh. And the way that you pronounce this word in Greek is sarx. Sarx is the nominative singular. And sarkos. Sarkos. Okay? So as I shared before, with the third declension, um, the, the, uh, sometimes the, the, uh, sometimes the stem gets hidden, right? And that's why we have to have the genitive singular to show us the, the true stem. So in the, if that is the case, I'm going to underline under the genitive singular the stem. That is our stem, sigma, alpha, rho, kappa. Sigma, alpha, rho, kappa. Okay? That is our stem right there. So with that being said, I'm just going to copy and I'm going to put this, this stem in the following places. So just repeat after me, if you will. I'm going to put it in the genitive, singular, the dative, the accusative singular, okay? And then I'm also going to put it in the plural, nominative, the genitive plural, skip in the dative, and then... I'm going to also put it in the accusative, okay? Professor? Yes. How do you know there's a kappa there? Um, because the, the reason why, the reason why is, well, so basically, this is the actual uh, spelling of the word. This is the actual spelling of the word. But the reason why is because that is its full stem. That is its full stem. And so, um, and the reason why I also put it in these specific locations is because you actually see the full stem in these in these different uh, forms. In these different forms, the stem unfortunately gets hidden in the nominative singular and the dative plural. But um, because it's Greek, and that's what it is, if this is actually its full stem. And that's why I add the, added the kappa there. Yeah, I'm saying you added it when you first started and you, and you uh, changed it at the top right by the lexical form. How would you know that the, that the K or the kappa went there to replace? The kasi? Because uh, um, <laughs> it's the Greek word, I, 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 there's really no other, there's really no answer, other answer than that. Um, when you actually see it in a lexicon, um, that's how the Greeks spelled it, and so, um, so, so that's why I know I, I actually memorized the actual word for it. Okay, I was thinking there might be a 
No, 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 no. There's no pattern. There's no pattern. The pattern comes after the fact. But no, this is the actual word for 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 flesh. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to do is, after filling out all these particular spots that I just did, I'm going to add now the noun ending, the third declension noun ending to each and every one that I did, okay? So for the genitive singular, I'm going to put Omicron Sigma, and that's an O, so I have to change it into... Uh, Greek, Omicron Sigma, Sarkos. The dative singular, I just add that Yoda, right? Sarki. All right, the accusative, I add an alpha. All right, nominative plural, epsilon sigma. Genitive plural, just like just like in our first and second declension, omega nu. And then finally, our accusative plural is alpha sigma. Okay, so with these forms specifically, we actually see the full stem, the sigma, alpha, rho, kappa, okay? Now I'm going to do the nominative singular and then the dative plural. So before, so here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it step by step. I'm going to add our stem first, okay? I'm going to add our stem first, all right? And then formulaically, I'm going to add a plus sign, all right? With it, oops, with it, uh, so, I'm sorry. With it, I'm going to have that sigma, all right? So that's what's happening right now. I have, and I apologize for that, I have our stem, sigma, alpha, rho, kappa, with its noun ending, all right? What's happening here is our kappa is is a is a uh, is a consonant stop, isn't it? And so, when I talk about fusing together, literally, that's exactly what they do. They fuse together. All right. So this kappa and sigma scrunch up to become one consonant. All right. And that's what that uh, that's what that uh, product comes from. That's where the kasi comes from. Okay, so once we have the sigma and the kappa next to each other, that forms a kasi. Okay, and that's where we that's what we that's what we have now. All right. Is anyone confused about that? I heard someone unmute themselves. So, question? I was thinking about making a comment, but I think uh, I think I'm so lost. It's just a lost. Comment. <laughs> so, do we understand what why we don't have two separate consonants? They just form this kasi.
Okay. So then let me continue to our dative plural, all right? And I'll do the exact same thing. Add that plus the sigma yoda, all right? The sigma yoda. Like I said with the uh, nominative singular, that kappa and sigma, they they fuse together. They they become one flesh. That's what happens. They literally become one. They become one. And that particular thing is the kasi. Okay? And so we don't have the kappa sigma there anymore. We have our kasi, our kasi left with it. Hence why it's sarksi. Leanne has a question, and I'm going to answer her question. Yes, they are actually on. Um, this presentation is actually on Smoodle now. Professor. Yes. So, so we leave the Yoda there as well. Yes, because that's part of the. That's actually part of the. Uh, the. Um, excuse me. That is actually the part of the noun ending. The sigma Yoda is the noun ending for the dative plural third declension. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, before I then continue on with my next example, there's, a, there's certain things that I have to let you guys know, okay? Um, and they have to do with the genitive singular and the accusative form, all right? Look at the genitive singular here. Sarkos. Sarkos. Um, in regards to the first and second declension, Raise your hand if you if you know the answer. In regards to the first and second declension, what form does this look like? And in what declension? If we didn't know that this was a third declension word, what what form would it be? And That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Hence, another reason why, of all the lists of reasons why I don't like the third declension, it can confuse us if we don't know this word. You know, it can totally confuse us because when we see it, we can assume, oh, wait a minute, that's a, that's a nominative singular, masculine, in the second declension form. But it's not, unfortunately. And so that's, we have to be familiar with that or we have to pay attention to that um, when, we, when we go and translate Greek or when we do Greek. Okay, um, that will also affect when we try to find it in a lexicon. Okay, because this technically is not the lexical form. Unfortunately, like I said, all lexical form is the nominative singular, so this will be our lexical form. You know, and that's what we have to find in the actual um, in the um, in the lexicon. Okay, and then again with accusatives, these look like with the alpha and the alpha sigma. These actually look like um, the accusatives and the first declension, don't they? And so we just got to be, we got to pay attention to that. We have to pay attention to that and realize that the third declension doesn't seem as all as it seems. You know, it has, it has similarities to the other declensions, unfortunately. Okay, so just keep that in mind. All right, so that's my first example with the, with the Veller. Now I'm going to show you a dental, a dental example. Okay? Yes. Does someone have a question? Okay. All right. So then the next question I have, or the next word I have, is a dental example. All right?
Yes, this one currently was a velar example. So the next one is a dental example. All right. So our dental word is Omicron Nu, Omicron Mu Alpha. Omicron Nu, Omicron Mu Alpha. Onama, Onama. Okay. I'm going to give you next the Greek to get the full the full uh, stem of it. Omicron Nu, Omicron Mu Alpha Tau. Omicron Sigma. Anomatos. Okay. And our word here in English, what it means is name. This is the word for name. Okay, um, I don't have this anywhere in my notes, but I do want to um, mention this because it's really important to, um, and it's, it's a good flag, it's a good clue to uh, recognize the gender of these particular words, okay? So, um, in your notes, just write down, whenever you see a mu alpha towards the middle or end of a word, okay, whenever you see that mu alpha in the middle or the end of a word, just like this, um, it is a neuter third declension word. Okay. Whenever you see this mu alpha at the end or a middle of a word, it always tells you that it is a neuter third declension word. Now, granted, there's other words out there in the third declension that does not have that. Like, for example, um, poor for fire. Pi, Upsilon, Rho, right? But those are the exceptions. Those are the exceptions, okay? And like I said, they're a rarity, and so rare you can recognize them easily. But commonly, whenever you see, one more time, this Mu Alpha at the end or middle of a word, that is a big clue because these are for sure uh, neuter third declension words, okay? Okay, so um, like before, like in my first example, the pure stem, the pure stem is this right here. That is your actual stem for this word. Okay? So that being said, I'm going to just delete everything that's in here, and then I'm just going to copy this, and I'm going to put it in the places that will not hide the stem, okay? Leaving the nominative singular as well as the dative um, sing, uh, plural out for now, okay? So just take your time to write out this chart. And I apologize. I have to actually do the accusative as well. So for the accusative, take that tau alpha. And the reason why I do that is because remember before with the second declension neuter words, um, a characteristic of the neuter is that the nominative and accusative are identical. The nominative and the accusative are identical. Okay. So what I did with the nominative, I should have done with the accusative. So I apologize for that.
Professor, is that just in the third declension? Yes, that is just in the third declension. Um, but the characteristic of the neuter, that's also in the second declension. It happens in the second declension as well, where the idea is that the nominative and the accusative are identical in form. Okay, so let me add the endings right now. All right, to the genitive and dative singular. So the genitive, just like up here, all I need to do is add an Omicron Sigma, a nomatos. And then the date is singular, I just add a Yoda. For the nominative, uh, for, excuse me, for the genitive plural next, I'm going to add the uh, omega nu. Okay, now for the nominative and accusative plural, for the nominative and accusative plural, um, what happens is the epsilon sigma for the nominative plural that we've seen so far, with these ma, with these uh, mu alpha words, it changes, it changes, okay? And so instead of an epsilon sigma, this epsilon sigma becomes an alpha, okay? So all we need to do is just add an alpha. So whenever you see these mu alpha words, the nominative accusative plurals just are, is just an alpha. So we have anomata. Okay, let me do the dative plural first, okay, to show you what the dental does to it. Um, so I'm going to add the actual stem, all right, and then we're going to do sigma yoda, just like I did before, okay. So the way that these dentals behave is this tau, when it sees a sigma coming at it, it runs away. It runs away, okay. And so what happens is 
this tau just drops. It gets eliminated. It disappears, if you will. And so you're just left off with the noun ending. And that's what that is. That's what occurs right there. So the tau or any dental consonant drops and we have simply the sigma. Okay, and then finally with the nominative, all I'm going to do is just add this here to the nominative singular. Because like I said, with neuter words, the nominative and accusative are identical. Any questions? Yes. Go ahead, Patricia. Oh, oh well, no, Tammy has a question. Okay, go ahead, Tammy. Uh, um, I understand that the nominative of singular and the accusative are identical. What I'm not understanding is how you came up with the accusative in the first place. Okay, right. So in this particular case, um, just let's go back to the second declension forms. You know, how there's a masculine, specific masculine form, and then there's a specific neuter form. And so what happens is with the neuter here, we don't have a sigma anymore. All it is is it's just, it's just there by itself. And what happens is the, the, um, the tau disappears because the sigma disappears with it. And so that's why we're left off, left off with this alpha at the end. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, um, let's see. Sigma can't be together. The tau and the sigma can't be the, the, together, right. And let me say the sigma, the sigma, oh. yes, the tau and the sigma don't like being together. They, they don't, and we don't see that in Greek at all. And so that's why it, it's gone in this, in the, in, for the neuters. And and also another thing too is that the sigma for the third declension for the sigma for the third declension it's only there it's only there for the masculine and feminine words because this is a neuter word the sigma is not there anymore so that's another reason why we don't have the sigma. Any other questions? Okay. So let me finish then with the third declension. We won't go over the third declension, um, or that's it for the third declension. And um, then I wish to finish off this with the definite article, the definite article, okay?
So um, I don't have an explanation for what the definite articles are because they actually are very easy to know. The definite article in English is what? It's the, T-H-E, the, okay? But the reason why I want to bring up the definite article is because um, when we're trying to, we've come to this point where you, you realize, um, where, and I've told you that sometimes even though nouns follow these patterns, even though nouns follow these patterns, um, a lot of these nouns change. A lot of these nouns change. And for the short time that we have to really grasp the change, um, it takes time. It takes time to memorize these and so forth. So um, I want to bring up the definite article because the definite article lets us know, especially when a noun is unfamiliar, when it's not recognizable, if there's a definite article in front of the word, we will always know the case, gender, and number of that word. Okay? So the definite article is like a life, life preserver, if you will. If you're unsure of what um, if you're unsure of what a noun is in regards to its case, gender, and number, just pray that there's a definite article in front of it. Because as long as you know the definite article, then you know what kind of noun it is in regards to its case, gender, and number. Okay, and so be, that being said, here's the reason why um, that is the case. What we have here is a chart of all the definite articles. Okay, and um, and basically what they are for majority of them, they're just really the noun endings of the first and second declension. That's all they are. That's all they are. But they never change. They never, ever change. Never change. So you'll see these with second declension words. You'll see this with first declension words. And you'll also see these with third declension words. Okay? But as long as you have this definite article in front of a third declension word, you know exactly what the case, gender, and number it will be. Okay? So my, my tip for you guys is really um, a major priority is just to memorize these definite articles. Go ahead, Tony. It's going to be before the word, like in English. Okay, um, one thing that I do wish to share about it as you're writing down these um, definite articles um, is notice for the nominative and the feminative, feminative huh, the, excuse me, the nominative for the masculine and feminine singular and plural. Notice the uh, breathing over it, okay? That here are rough breathings. They are rough breathings, okay? So the way that we pronounce this word is not O, but ha, ha, okay? And then this word is hey, not A, but hey, because of that rough breathing. Same thing here. This one is hoy, and then hi, okay? So just pay attention to those rough breathings for the nominative masculine feminine.
Yes, there's a question. Thank you. Um, yeah. So on like some of these words, like that little like semicircle above like the the upsilon or yes. the eta or yes. the omega. What is that? And then like that little dash thing, not the breathing mark, but the other one. I'm this one right here. Right. So okay. what they? Uh, great question. Very good question. What these are. So there's the little circle, half circle thing right here, and then there's the little dash like right here, okay? They're accent markers. They are accent markers, okay? Um, specifically, if you want to know, this half circle is known as a circumflex, and this one is known as a cute accent, okay? Um, they have their own set of rules on when to use these accent markers. Um, for me personally, they're way too confusing, and it's really difficult to teach the accent markers. So I'm not going to tell you the behavior of these accent markers, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you guys know, in order to identify the word um, by the accent marker, I'll, I'll emphasize it when that's the case. Okay? So don't worry about these accent markers now until I mention it and that I want you to specifically write them um, um, for the word and so forth. Okay, so um, it's, what time is it? It's 5 o'clock at my time here, so I'm assuming it's 7 over in Texas, and then um, wherever, whoever is at, it's 8, I believe, in, um, if it's Eastern time. So why don't we take a break, finish up this, these endings here. We'll take a 30-minute break, and then we'll resume back, okay? So, um, so yeah, let's take a 30-minute break. Um, I have up in our screen right now John 1, 1 through 5, okay? And um, like I said, if you're, un if you're unfamiliar with the ending, but you know the definite article, the definite article is what's going to save you. It's what's going to help you know what the case, gender, and number of a word may be, okay? So for example, let's go for the very first word that we have. Logos. Now, yes, it is a very common word. In, um, we hear our pastors say it all the time, right? But what if we didn't know the actual case, gender, and number of the word, right? And so it's like, well, how do we figure that out? Well, what's in front of it? It's the definite article, okay? And so if we know the definite article and we can memorize the definite article, we'll know what the word it's attributed to um, will be, okay? Um, here's the here's I think the greatest example of that when we don't know the ending of a word. Let's go to this word, fos, fos. One we don't know if it's we don't know if it's second or first declension. It doesn't look familiar. It doesn't follow the second and first declension um, pattern. Okay, so we can assume um, that it's a third declension, but from there. This is just such an obscure third declension word. I, I'm incapable of memorizing off the top of my head. But what's in front of it? Ah, we have a definite article in front of it. And no matter how weird or how obscure the word looks like, 
we know the case, gender, and number because of that definite article. So going to your chart and raise your hand if you have the answer, what is the case, gender, and number of this, of this word false because of this definite article? Good. Someone said it. Someone said the gender. That's exactly right. It's neuter. And then give me the case and the and then the number. Singular nominative. Exactly. Beautiful. That's exactly right. What else could it also be though? Because it's a neuter. What other case? Accusative. Brilliant. Exactly. So again, I have no idea what the form is. I don't know what that looks like. I have, I'm trying to memorize all these different patterns and this one is like a curveball to me, you know, but oh, thank God, you know, there's a definite article in front of it. And so because of that definite article, I now know that it is a either accusative or a nominative neuter um, singular. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Um, Let's see, let's see, is there another good example like that? Um, now, granted, look at this one, ton, theon, you know? Both of the endings look the same, right? So that's, that's not that hard, but like I said, if we just know the definite article, again, we know the case, gender, and number, okay? Um, questions about this? Professor? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. On that neuter, uh, that neuter singular nominative word or accusative. Right. Um, how are you going to know which one it, it is? If it's nominative or accusative, or is it's that where you write down the sentence? It's great. Exactly. It's that's a great question. It's basically how it's used in the sentence when we translate. And so for me, that's why to to give me one or the other as an answer is really acceptable. You know, because it's, that's exactly what it is. If I asked you how it's used in the sentence, that's a whole different story, which I'm not going to teach you. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, but like if, if I just asked you to identify the case, gender, and number for me, you're going to give me either the nominative, um, the nominative neuter singular or the accusative neuter singular. And both are perfectly correct. All right, thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's see. Let's continue on with um, the next presentation that I have, and it has to do with pronouns and adjectives. Pronouns and adjectives. Okay, so the first thing that I want to talk about are adjectives and how adjectives function and behave in um, in the Greek. But uh, so let's begin and. Um, Okay, brilliant. Um, so just a little review. What is an adjective? An adjective just simply describes a noun. Um, another, way of, another way of saying what adjectives do is that they modify nouns, modify nouns. They either modify it or describe it. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably, okay? But if there's any confusion, just please ask a question, okay? Um, we need to understand that in the Greek, in the Greek, the adjective must agree in case, gender, and number to the noun it modifies. Okay? And I'll show you examples of that um, in a little bit. But one more time. In Greek, the adjective must agree in case, gender, and number to the noun it modifies. Okay? So if you had a masculine dative singular noun, the adjective needs to be masculine dative singular, okay, in order for it to be used with that noun. So like I say, and let me reiterate, if a noun is nominative feminine plural, 
its adjective must also be the same thing. It must be nominative, feminine, plural. Now, sometimes the endings of the noun and its adjectives will be identical, sometimes, okay? And that will be beautiful. In an ideal world, it should be like that all the time. Sometimes, however, it won't. It won't be identical because of the declension, okay? Um, so adjectives will be um, in a particular declension, like third declension, um, but then it's modifying a second declension word. So we'll have a difference there. But most often than not, um, the adjective ending will be identical to its noun ending. So the big rule here for adjectives in the Greek is this. It must agree with the noun it's modifying on its case, gender, and number. All right, I'm going to continue on. There are three uses of not nouns, I apologize. There's three uses of adjectives in the Greek. Three uses of adjectives in the Greek, okay? And they're not in a particular order, all right? But there's the attributive, the predicate, and the substantival or substantival. also known as the substantive. And then what I'm going to do next now is I'm going to explain the, uh, each, um, each one more specifically, okay? So let me do the attributive first. The attributive is the default understanding of how to use adjectives. So when we use adjectives in English, um, the answer most often than not is basically like the good student or the hard book or, or um, the delicious meal. All those things are basically the way that we understand how to use an adjective. And this is that way. It is known as the attributive way. The attributive way. Okay? When, in Greek, when an adjective is used in the attributive way, that adjective has a definite article. That adjective has a definite article. Okay, so whenever you see an adjective with the definite article and its noun that goes with it, um, most likely than not, it's used as the attributive, like the good word or uh, the good person, um, the evil demon, you know. Th that is the most common way and the default way of how adjectives are used in correspondence to their nouns. Okay, and I provide you three examples here. Okay, so the first example um, I give you right now. So I'll read this sentence to you guys, all right, and I'll read it slowly. Ha agathos 
anthropos. Okay? One more time. Ha agathos anthropos. Now, I'm going to underline our adjective here twice. This is our adjective. All right? This is our adjective. All right? And remember how I told you the rule in Greek is for the noun that it's modifying, the adjective has to agree in case, gender, and number. And thankfully, in this particular example, we have the endings here similar, don't we? And so, for example, if this is um, anthropos is a nominative masculine singular, okay? How do I know this? One, I know that it is because of that sigma ending. And I know that it's masculine because of that omicron right there, okay? So because of that ending, I know that it's a nominative masculine singular. And I apologize how it's written. It's difficult when I write with my mouse. But that's what it is. It's a nominative masculine singular. Okay? If this is our adjective, which, is, which it is, agathos, that means that it needs to have the same kind of noun ending, which in this case is nominative masculine singular in the second declension. Hence why they are in agreement. Okay? So that's what I mean when the adjective has to agree in case, gender, and number with its noun. Okay? Another, the second example of the attributive use of it is this. Sometimes, um, sometimes the definite article will also have, uh, the noun that it's modifying will also have its definite article, okay? So I'll read this, ha anthropos, ha agathos, okay? So when you see this form of adjective-noun relationship, this lets you know that this is used as an attributive. And by the way, if I didn't mention it, I'll mention it again, um, or I'll mention it this time. Uh, agathos is our word for good. Oh my gosh, I'm so horrible at this. But it's our word for good. And um, this kind of good is a moral good, like a good person, a good person. Um, morally good person, I should say. Okay? So... Would anyone want to take a stab at translating this, if this is the attributive uh, use of the adjective? Who wants to take a stab at it? Josh, go for it, Josh. And I have to unmute you, sir. Where, what happened? Where is Josh? <laughs> oh, I guess so. So, uh, um, well, I see him there. Something must have happened with his webinar. But... Uh, Tony. Tony has his hand up. So go for it, Tony. Try it out. I was from four. I don't want to try it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Then the last person is North Texas. Anyone from North Texas, their hand, their hand was up. Who would like to try it out? Are you, are you asking us to translate the first one? The um, well, both will be the same answer. Both will be the same answer, but I was actually specifically asking someone to translate the second example. Because I give you the adjective, the translation of the adjective, which is good. Yes, yes, very good. So anthropos can be translated as human, so I'll accept that. So how would you translate this phrase? Ha anthropos, ha agathos. A human is good? That would be the next example, which is the predicate example. Think of the default understanding of how to use an adjective. A good man. Yes, yes. Who said it? Who said it? Philip Kennedy. Who? Philip who? Kennedy. Philip. Excellent. I give you two thumbs up. That's exactly right. 
the answer to, to translate this sent or not sentence, excuse me, to translate this phrase is simply the good man or the good human, the good human or the good person. Um, because we can translate anthropos in those three ways, you know, but that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Okay, so um, excellent. Very good. Very good. Now there's one one other example, one other example that I'm going to show you guys. This one is the rarest example. This one is the rarest example. Okay, and so basically this example is as follows. Anthropos ha agathos. Anthropos ha agathos. Um, where what we have here is the noun does not have a definite article, but the adjective that it is attributing it to is does have the article. Oh, okay. So, Josh, go ahead. You have your hand up. No, I just have my hand up for you to unmute me. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, so that's the third rarest example of it. You'll see the first two most often than not. But the the moral of the story for this example is that the adjective will have a definite article. And once the adjective has a definite article, then that'll let you know that it's going to be used attributively. So like the good man or the beautiful woman or the evil book, you know. So that's how we use attributive. Okay? Questions? Go ahead. Uh, on the, the second one, there's, yes. an article, there's an article before um, the noun. That's okay, so I, are you talking about this one? Yes. Are we supposed to say that? Do that you yes, you yes you are. You are supposed to say this one. So it would be ha anthropos ha agathos. And it still means the good man. That's exactly what it still means. Correct. Okay. No, you don't. You don't. Um, this will be the good man. That's exactly how you would say it. Yes, Tony, go ahead. Is this why the Greek civilization did not survive? <laughs> <laughs> um, Possibly, possibly. There's there's a lot of redundancy in Greek, and um, and that might just have been the case. They were just too slow. They were just too slow to de develop, you know. But um, another person would have a perspective and say, well, what do you mean? Greek society has survived in America, you know. So, but but uh, that might have been the case. <laughs> Perhaps that might be the reason why Greece is in such a state as it is right now. You know, I'm just saying so. <laughs> But um, any other questions or comments? <laughs> when God confused their language, and gave them Greek. I'm sorry. Say that again. When God confused their language and gave them Greek. <laughs> that that's, that could be possible too. That could be possible too. And then in His grace, He uses this language to share His His uh, New Testament. So so um, I guess uh, it goes back to the old cliche adage. The Lord works in mysterious ways. So, <laughs> all right. So let's continue on. If there's no other questions, to the next use. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I just had kind of a stupid question. No, um, such so I know why the gamma. So I know why the ga uh, the gamma has the G sound. Okay. Um, but it looks more like a Y or whatever. But right. just that single. Like O, oh, this one right here. It's pronounced ha. You said ha. Yes, yes, yes. Um, the reason so why is, I, that the, is that the only one that's just like a single, a single word or whatever that has a sound like that. Um, I must have missed that part. It's it's unique to it, yes. Um, but the reason why it has this special sound is because of that kind of accentuation above the Omicron. That is a rough breathing right there. And so whenever you have a rough breathing over any vowel, you add a, you have to add that H sound in front of it. That's why I pronounce it as ha rather than just ah. Gotcha. Okay? So All good right, question. 
It's not a stupid question. There's no such things as stupid questions in this class. So, okay, great. So let's continue on. And let's talk about the predicate, okay? Now, um, please ignore that example for just a moment. Um, the predicate was basically the initial, uh, the initial attempt that someone made uh, when we talked about the attributive, where someone said, um, the man or the human is good, right? That's how the predicate is done, or that's how um, an adjective is used as a predicate. So basically, in the predicate use, an adjective modifying the noun is being stated in a simple sentence, okay? So the book is evil, or the book is good, or the woman is beautiful, or the man is handsome. Those are all sentence-like statements to convey the noun, okay? So that's the predicate use, the predicate use. Um, a clue to help us understand between the attributive and the predicate, um, predicate, the word, is an old-fashioned word to say verb, the verb. What is the predicate of the sentence, you know? And so that being said, with the use of adjectives, think about it this way. We need to add a verb to, uh, to correctly translate this kind of use, right? We need to add the verb is or are. Like, you are students. You are Greek students. You are great Greek students, you know? That's how the predicate is being used. Okay, so I give you the easy example to this one. Oh, no, no, no. Which is, the word is good. You're just saying it in a simple stated say sentence. Okay, now in the Greek, how we understand if an adjective is used as a predicate, um, basically it is op opposite of the attributive. The adjective does not have an article. The adjective does not have an article. So here is that first example that unfortunately I did not hide, but it was definitely visible for this entire slide, which is, and I'll read, agathos ha anthropos, agathos ha anthropos. And like I shared before, agathos, I'll underline twice as our adjective, okay? There's no definite article in front of it. It's gone. It's not there, all right? However, anthropos does have a definite article, all right? Um, and the way that this is written, it lets us know the distinction that the adjective does not have one, but the noun does, okay? So in this case, in this case, the way that we translate this sentence will be the man, the human being, or the person is good, is good, okay? So you need to add that, that verb there, okay? Um, another way that this could be written in Greek is ha anthropos agathos. Okay, so in this, in this particular example, the noun is first with its definite article, but the key here is that the adjective, which I'll underline again, does not have it. It does not have the definite article, okay? And so that is the way that we identify between the attributive and the predicate. The predicate, the adjective does not have a definite article, and the attributive, it does, okay? Questions about that? Oops. Let me finish. Uh, I apologize for that. So let me repopulate all that again. And then um, I'll continue on to the next use, which I uh, prematurely clicked on. Professor? Yes, go ahead. That, that is correct. That is correct. So, or the better way of saying it is that the, the adjective does not have the definite article.
All right, may I continue on? Okay, I'm going to continue on. And the third final use of adjectives is known as the substantive. Substantive, okay? The substantive is when the adjective does not have a noun, it modifies. There's no noun that's present, basically, okay? The modified noun is not there. And what happens with the substantive is this. Um, the adjective, it takes place of a noun. It substitutes in for a noun, basically. And what we have is basically the adjective by itself. Now, in English, um, th it, this is actually a very common thing to do. Is that, um, and so, uh, so I, I, I provide for the next slide a very good example of what a, what a substantive is in the English. Okay, so uh, just take a moment. I'll return back to this slide. But um, it's one of my more favorite movies. It's a Clint Eastwood movie. But these are three statements that are substantive statements, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, that is how the substantive works, all right? It's when there is no noun present, okay, but the adjective replaces or substitutes for the noun, all right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, in this case, the uh, nouns are implied, aren't they? The nouns are implied, right? So it's like the good man, uh, the bad man, and the ugly man, right? Because those were the three main characters in the movie. Um, so that is an English example of the substantive. So like I said, it's basically the adjective is the only thing that's there. There's no noun, there's, excuse me, there is no noun that it modifies, okay? The adjective is by itself, all right? And so an example of this using our trusted adjective agathos is hoi agathoi, hoi agathoi. Okay, where the translation is technically or literally the good, but what you can imply here is because of it, because of its gender, it's a masculine gender, you can also say men, the good men, or to be more, or to be closest to the translation, it would be the good ones. Okay, and so the reason why I put parentheses around ones or men is because that is the implied word. That we don't see that word in, in the New Testament. Or, excuse me, this isn't the New Testament. We don't see that word in this example. We only see the adjective, which is the good. All right? So questions about substantive. All right. Now, some of you might be asking, well, Professor, what if neither the adjective or the noun has an article? What happens then? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, so what happens if there are no articles? Because that can happen. That happens actually a lot in the New Testament. Okay. So when there are no definite articles for either the adjective or its noun, what is it? Is it used attributively? predicately or substantively, okay? Here's the answer. It can be any of the three, unfortunately. Unfortunately, you can translate it in any of the three. So whenever you see 
just the adjective and the noun by itself, like um, agathoi anthropoi. There's no definite article. You can translate it either as an attributive, as a predicate, um, well, not as a substantive, but definitely at either, either one of those two, unfortunately, okay? Um, the way that we need to understand it, though, is based on the context, what is the best translation? What is the best translation, okay? And let me say it this way. Nine out of ten times, the best translation is going to be the attributive way, the attributive, where it is the good man or the good men or the good people, okay? All right, may I continue on? Okay, so from the silence, I will just assess that we're going to continue on. So our, my next slide um, has to do with, oh, yay, there's a hand up. Go ahead, Tony. I am recording this, yes, sir. All right, so adjectives and declensions, adjectives and declensions. So like I said, like I said, the rule for adjectives, the go-to rule for adjectives, it must agree in case, gender, and number with the noun it modifies, okay? The adjective must agree in case, gender, and number with the noun it modifies, right? And the examples that I provided for you um, what they showcase is that uh, most often than not, the adjective will have the identical noun ending as the noun it's modifying or the noun that it's describing, okay? That's, that's great. That's awesome. But sometimes, sometimes, and I have to let you guys know this, sometimes some adjectives do not always follow the same declension of the noun it modifies. For example, you might have a second declension masculine noun but a third declension masculine adjective, okay? So even though the declensions don't match up, if they agree in case, gender, and number, most often than not, they are connected with each other, that the adjective is describing that noun, okay? Yes. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. How can how can we uh, hopefully remove some of the confusion? What um is there is there could I probe a question of what specifically we're being confused with? Okay, so then let me just give you an example. Let me give you an example. Um, please don't, please don't, I guess because of the fact that I have my presentation online right now, the following slide, I don't want you to, I don't want you guys to write everything out. Um, that being said, the reason why I say that is just there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff, okay? But this Following this following uh, slide that I'm going to show you guys right now is basically um, a third declension adjective. Okay, so it is an adjective, but it the um, the way that it breaks down in its different functions is down um, is based on the third declension. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show you guys right now. After I show you guys that, then I'm going to show you an example of how it's used. Okay, so. Here's that slide, okay? This slide is for the adjective pas, 
pas. Pas means all or every. All or every. Okay? Now you'll notice here in the masculine as well as the neuter, it follows the third declension. It follows the third declension. So we have pas, pantas, panti, panta, and so forth. Okay? For the feminine, for the feminine, it's using the first declension, which is great. It makes every, it makes things super easy, especially when you have feminine nouns. Okay? So basically, here's what I'm trying to say now. Here's what I'm trying to say. Um, and hopefully some of you guys have this presentation up already. But what I'm going to use is I'm going to use the genitive singular masculine pantos, that adjective. Okay? That's the one that I'm going to use. All right? So I'm going to take a moment to get out of this and get some, get a piece of paper going on here. Okay, so in English, in Ingrid, in English, I'm going to tra I'm going to write in Greek this following phrase. Okay, of, and that's in Greek, so I apologize for that. Of, of, oh man, of every word okay that's what I'm gonna translate in Greek alright now I've already provided for you what every means okay and in Greek that is pantos pantos okay pantos all right? Because it's in the third declension. Now, word is logos, logos. But in the genitive, what do I have to add at the end of logos to make it a genitive singular? And someone raise their hand. Go ahead, Tony. Upsilon. Excellent. That's exactly right. Exactly. So I'm going to add an upsilon to it, but I'm going to add also the definite article in front of it as well. So, um, no, I'm going to add the definite article in front of pantas, which is two, pantas, lagu. Okay? Two, pantas, lagu. Okay? Both pantas and lagu... Both pantas and lagu, they agree in case, gender, and number, okay? Pantas is genitive masculine singular in the third declension. Lagu is genitive masculine singular in the second declension. But they don't look alike. That's the problem here. That's the issue that I wanted to talk about. So even though they agree in case, gender, and number, they don't look exactly the same just as just when I used with my other examples, um, ha, agathos, anthropos. Right? In this example, ha, agathos, anthropos, the endings are the same. They're identical. They're identical. And that's a beautiful thing. And I wish Greek was like that 100% of the time, you know, where the noun endings look exactly the same with each other. Unfortunately, that's not the case because of this example. We have the Omicron Sigma here, but it's the Omicron Upsilon for the noun. And so that's what I was talking about in regards to this mishmash between declensions, unfortunately, where even though the declensions are different, and they look different, they actually agree. They actually agree. Okay? D does that make sense? Will the article and the noun have the same ending and then 
the, the action in between, I mean, we'll be able to kind of recognize it because of that? Exactly, exactly. Like I said, this article, it will never, ever change. Even if it's, if, even, even if it's um, a definite article for a third declension, that article will never, ever change. Okay? So, um, if, if I eliminated Lagu in this example, to Pontas, because of the fact that that definite article is there, I know the case, gender, and number, because it will never, ever change. Okay. So look for the article. Exactly. That's why I call it the lifesaver. So I pray when I read text, I pray, Lord, let every word have a definite article, because I know my definite articles, you know? And so that's, that's exactly right. Always look for the definite article, because like I said, as we can see here, nouns change. Nouns change a lot, you know? And there's a lot of exceptions to nouns. But the definite article, you can trust them. You can trust them. Was there a question? I heard a question. It will it will go with the noun and the adjective. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Patricia. This is like not really uh, kind of uh, relative to what you're talking about, but I noticed you're in LibreOffice. Um, how do I get the Greek font in there? Um, that is a great question. I have a link, and I will find that link, and I will email it to you guys, or I can post it up on a. Uh, I can post it up on uh, Smoodle somewhere, so um, you can do the, because it's like a long process, and um, it does take time, but I will definitely, if you guys are interested, I'll definitely get you guys uh, the uh, instructions for that. You can do, you can do Greek and Hebrew, actually, which is really cool. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so that slide that I talked about how even though words, the words have to. This is an absolute command, okay? It will never, ever change. There, nothing will change it because God has ordained it so. For adjectives, it must agree in case, gender, and number, okay? That is an absolute statement. I will guarantee that. That is an absolute statement. It must agree in case, gender, and number, okay? The difficulty is sometimes there's different declensions. That's the problem. And that was the example that I showed you guys. Okay? All right. Cool. Um, and, again, if there's any other questions, just interrupt me or raise your hand via a uh, webinar. But let's continue on now to the pronouns. Okay? Okay, so the pronouns that I would like to cover are the following. Okay, um, and I think I'm showing my screen. Am I showing my screen? Yes, I am. Okay, so here are the pronouns that we're going to go over. Um, and I don't know why it did this, but personal pronouns. We're going to go over the personal pronouns. They are the first, second, and third personal pronouns, or third person personal pronouns. Then we have demonstrative pronouns, we have relative pronouns, and then indefinite and interrogative pronouns, okay? I'm going to give a little word of warning right now. This is going to be very copy intensive. This, is, this, half, this portion of our presentation is a very copy intensive presentation. So if you don't have arthritis or carpal tunnel now, You'll probably have it after this presentation. That's all I'm going to say. Um, that being said, if you don't have the time or if you're not quick enough or fast enough to write everything down as I continue on, um, I assure you this presentation is on Smoodle, so you can just retrace and regroup and return back to the presentation and copy it for your notes. Okay? So, But that's what we're going to go through now. We're going to talk about all these different 
pronouns. All right? So let's begin with the personal pronouns. All right, the personal pronouns. There are three types which are based on person or point of view. We have the first, that's the first person, that's I, we, and so forth, okay? Then we have the second, you or you all, you know? Um, and then we have the third, he, she, it, him, her, it, they, them, and so forth, okay? So that's what I mean by person. The third, first person pronoun, second person pronoun. It's basically point of view, point of view, okay? All right, so the first chart I'm going to show you guys is the first personal, first person, excuse me, personal pronoun, all right? So we have nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, all right? And these are the particular forms in the singular and plural, all right? And so in the nominative, that word is pronounced echo, echo. Okay? Um, you'll notice in the following singulars a parenthesized epsilon. Why do I do that? Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not, okay? And what it's called officially is known as an enclitic emphatic epsilon, okay? And what the New Testament writers would do, it's personal choice if they want to add the epsilon in front of it or not, okay? But the reason why, according to some theorists, is that they use the epsilon in front of it for emphasis, for emphasis, to let to let the reader know that this is an important pronoun within the sentence or within the story or something like that. It's used for emphasis, okay? But sometimes it's not there. Sometimes it's not there. Sometimes you'll just see that mu in front of it, okay? So the genitive singular is mu, dative is moi, accusative is me, okay? Now, for the plural, it is uh, Ada. Ada starts the word, but again, notice the rough breathing over it. So you need to add the H sound in front of the Ada, which is Hemes, Hemes, Hemon, Hemin, Hemas. Okay? So these are your first person personal pronouns. Um, why do I bring this up? When you go and try to do a word study um, and you look at these words, you can really just ignore these words because, again, they're just, um, they're just pronouns. That's all they are, you know. Most likely than not, your word study will focus on nouns, you know. Um, here, you could just say, okay, I know what this is. I'm just going to forget about it and just move on, okay. So it's just really to identify what they are and, um, and basically ignore them when you do word studies. Okay, may I continue on? Thumbs up? Okay, our next person, oh, oh I'll, I'll say this after our second person pronouns. Our next one is the second person personal pronouns, all right? And what we have here in the singular is they all begin with sigma. So this is a sigma right here. Okay, so the nominative singular is su. Genitive, phonetically, it's the same. It's su. Dative is soy and se. And then for the plural, instead of the adas from the first, it's now replaced with the upsilon. Humes, humon, humin, humas.
All right. So I'm going to continue on next now to our third person. I'm not going to show you guys the chart, but um, I'm definitely going to show you guys uh, the chart later. Um, I, I totally forgot what I had to say. Um, so it just, I just, it just popped into my head. In regards to first person personal pronouns and second person personal pronouns, they do not have gender. Okay? So that's one big, big tidbit of information that I need to let you guys know. With first person personal pronouns and second person personal pronouns, they do not have gender. They do not convey gender. Was there a question? You cut out, and somebody was just wondering why you said they don't have, and then it cut out. Oh, okay. They don't have gender. The first person personal pronouns and the second person personal pronouns do not have gender. Um, did, did, did we get that last part? I noticed some of the screens have frozen, are frozen. Yes, Professor, we got it. Okay, cool. All right, so now let's go into the third person pronouns, all right? So the third person pronouns, like I said, they're basically he, him, she, her, it, etc. they, them, and so forth, all right? The way that the third person personal pronouns behave are much like adjective. They behave like an adjective. Okay? So it depends on the gender um, how uh, these, these, uh, this, uh, this pronoun is formed. Okay? So depending on the gender um, will also depend how this is going to be written or spelled and so forth. All right? Um, that being said, majority of the stem remains the same. Majority of the stem remains the same. It's alpha, upsilon, tau. Alpha, upsilon, tau. That remains the same in every form of the third person pronoun. Okay? What changes of the stem is that vowel at the end. It's the vowel at the end. Because that vowel will change depend on the gender, depending on the gender. So, for example, um, if you see an omicron at the end of this stem, it lets you know that it is masculine or neuter. If you see an alpha or an eta at the end of the stem, that lets you know that it is feminine. Okay, so if there's an Omicron stem, that is a masculine. If it's an al masculine neuter, I should say, if there's an alpha or an eta at the end of the stem, that is the feminine, okay? And then attached to that with the noun ending, that also depends on gender. That also depends on gender. Because it'll follow either the second declension or the, um, the second declension or the first declension. Yes. To yeah, go ahead, Tony. Okay, so uh, just for clarification, so we all understand here, the pronoun stem alpha, upsilon, uh, tau, you would add, if it's masculine or neuter, an omicron at the end? If right. The stem, at the end of the stem, right. At the end of those three letters? Yes, exactly, exactly. I'll show you guys in a chart what this looks like. Okay? So the next slide is the chart of the third person personal pronoun. All right? And hold on to your britches for right now. Okay? Here you go. There it is. All right? 
So this is what I mean. This is what I mean. You'll notice, you'll notice the alpha upsilon tau for all of the endings. Or excuse me, for all of the forms, don't you? Okay? So every every form has that absolute uh, excuse me every form has that alpha upsilon tau okay every form all right what I meant about the the vowel ending of the stem is this notice the omicron for the masculine and neuter that's what I mean about the the vowel the vowel stem changing okay and then for the feminine we have the eta as well as the alpha. Okay? So when you see the eta or alpha at the end of the of the alpha upsilon tau, that's a feminine. That's a feminine. Okay? But if you see the omicron, that is either a masculine or a neuter. That's what I mean by that. Okay? And then after that, all you need to do is attach the second declension endings to the masculine and neuter. And then the first declension ending for the feminine. And this is the third person personal pronoun. Questions? Okay, so for, um, so I'll just read them out to you, okay? And um, if you guys want, you can read them after I do. So uh, I'll do the masculine, and then the neuter, and then, and then the feminine, okay? So the nominative is autos, autos. And then autu. Auto, and then auton, good, plural, autoy, autone, autois, autus, excellent, very good, very good. For the neuter, I'll just do the nominative and accusative forms. Because you'll see that the genitive and dative for both the masculine and neuter are identical. Okay? So for this one, the nominative accusative singular is auta. Good. And then nominative, it is auta again. But instead of the omicron, it's an alpha. Okay? Let's do the feminine now. Let's do the feminine. All right? Aute. Outes. Aute. Outain. Outai. Outone. Altice. Altos. Good, good, good. So uh, that is that here are our third person um, personal pronouns. Okay. Um, one more thing before we get into demonstratives. I want us to focus on the accenting of the feminine nominative singular. Okay. There is a smooth breathing over the upsilon, and then there's an accent over the final syllable eta, okay? Write that down specifically. Write that down specifically, and I'll explain why when we get into the demonstrative. So again, there's a smooth breathing over the upsilon and an accent over the eta.
Yes, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you didn't have to. You didn't have to because, like I said, you can reference it. So if you didn't, if you didn't, then definitely write this one down. Definitely write the nominative feminine singular form with its particular accentuation, okay? And I'll explain why. I'll explain why, okay? So this one specifically, and only this one, have that particular accenting. All right? So those are our personal pronouns. We're done with our personal pronouns. Let's now go into our demonstrative pronouns. Okay? Our demonstrative pronouns. And let me delete all that. Okay. So there are only two kinds of demonstrative pronouns. Two kinds. They're classified as near pronouns and far demonstrative pronouns, all right? They are literally this and these, okay? That's the near, all right? And they, what they do is they convey location. They convey location. So, ex for example, um, when you're saying things that are near to you, this laptop, this book, this pencil, and so forth, that's a demonstrative near pronoun. The plural of that is these. These pens, these students, these chairs. Okay? So that's demonstrative. The far pronouns are that and those. That table. That coffee mug. Those books. Um, those are the far demonstrative pronouns. Okay? So those are what demonstrative pronouns are. There are just two kinds. And the way that the demonstrative pronouns work, um, they work a lot like adjectives. They behave a lot like ad adjectives, just like the third person pronouns. Our noun endings are different depending on gender, and then also the stem changes depending on gender, just like the third person pronouns. Okay, may I continue on? All right, so my first ones I'm going to talk about are, are near pronouns, the demonstrative near, all right? So the demonstrative near are masculine and neuter gender. They follow the second declension. They follow the they follow the second declension. All right, uh, the stem majority of the form stem is tau, omicron, upsilon tau omicron. Okay. There are exceptions to this, though. There are exceptions to this. 
The first exception that I want to mention are the masculine nominative forms. The masculine nominative forms drop the the T, or excuse me, drop the tau in front of it. Okay? So what you have is the omicron, upsilon, tau, omicron. Okay? So for the nominative masculine, that's what your stem is. For the neuter, nominative, accusative, plural, what changes is the diphthong. So instead of the omicron, upsilon, you have the alpha, upsilon. So it's tau, alpha, upsilon, tau. All right, so those are for your masculine and neuter words. The next one are your feminine, your feminine words. They follow the first declension. Okay, and for them, the stem is this one. Tau, alpha, upsilon, tau, eta, and sometimes alpha. Okay, so those switch, those switch. Go ahead, Tony. On the um, yes. Um. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because instead of an omicron, there's going to be an alpha at the end of it, which I'll show you in our chart. Okay, um, going back to the feminine, there's an exception to this feminine um, as well, and that exception is basically in the nominative forms. In the nominative forms, like the masculine, that tau gets dropped in front of it. So you're left with an alpha, upsilon, tau, eta, or an alpha. Okay. All right, so let me show you what this all means basically in a chart. And so the following chart is the demonstrative near pronouns, okay? So let me begin with the masculine and neuter. Like I said, majority of them have that tau, omicron, upsilon, tau stem. That's so, okay? Even in the plural. Okay, the difference, however, are the nominative masculine, where we have the omicron upsilon, okay, omicron upsilon here. Oh, and by the way, I would like for you to know that there's a rough breathing over it. So you got to add that H in front of it. So it's hutas, hutas, not utas, but hutas, hutas, okay? Same over here, hutoi, all right? The other exception was the nominative, accusative, plural, neuter. Instead of the omicron, upsilon, as you see here, it is an alpha, upsilon. So it's tau, ta, tau, ta. Okay? So there's those two exceptions. All right? The feminine, it really remains the same compared to the others. This is the majority of its stem. Okay? The only difference is the nominative forms. Okay? This is how te, how te, 
and how tie how tie all right now going back to this word right here all right I told you guys to remember the accent of the third person personal pronoun the reason being is if you don't pay attention to the accents these are in regards to the spelling exactly identical exactly identical okay the only difference is the accentuation here okay so the accent for the demonstrative near pronoun is in the first syllable the accent over here is in the second syllable all right so I, that's how you guys know between the demonstrative pronoun and the personal pronoun the third person personal pronoun Yes, go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Let me actually erase all this uh, chicken scratch I have here. So this this one, this one, and I can't write it for the life of me, is the demonstrative. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. This is the demonstrative right here. That's the demonstrative. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so this is the demonstrative. And then aute, this one right here, is the personal pronoun. So are they pronounced differently? Uh, yes, they are actually. So um, so for this one, if uh, this one will be pronounced aute, aute. Okay. The personal pronoun is to pronounce aute. So that's the difference. So the demonstrative is aute, and then the personal pronoun is aute. Yes. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that, you guys. <laughs> and um, I guess we're all on the Titanic with each other. So I'm I'm here with you. I'm 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 here with you in the midst of our confusion. <laughs> but um, I will like to add in this in this case uh, because of that because of just all this stuff that we're learning, and I really know you guys are just exhausted right now. I totally understand that. So. Um, and some of you have taken the opportunity to do so. Um, I just want to share, I'm available for you guys. So if you ever need some extra tutoring time, um, you just contact me and I'll be there for you guys. Okay? So, um, and hopefully that will clarify more of this confusion. Just a tad bit, but yeah. So. Okay? But um, I understand. I understand. But remain faithful, remain strong, and I'm, I'm with you to the end. So any other questions or comments? Okay, we're not going to finish everything, so I'm just going to do... Yes, go ahead. That's correct. Yes, ma'am. That's right. You're quite welcome. All right. All right. So the final one for the night is the demonstrative far pronouns, our demonstrative far pronouns, okay? And just like from the first one or the near ones, masculine neuter follows second declension. Masculine neuter follows second declension. And then the feminine will follow first. Okay, just like before, just like with our near ones. The demonstrative far are a lot easier to know, though, or a lot easier to know, okay? Because all genders have the same stem. All the genders will have the same stem, and that stem is epsilon, kappa, epsilon, yota, mu, okay? So all of them will have that stem or that part of the stem, 
okay? Epsilon, kappa, epsilon, iota, nu. So, like I said, that majority of the stem remains the same, okay? The only changes to the stem will be that final stem vowel because of gender, because of gender, right? Um, so, like, like before with the near, um, if you have an Omicron at the end of it, it's, either, it's a masculine or neuter, okay? If you have an alpha or an eta, that's a feminine. All right, so let's sh let me show you guys the demonstrative far pronouns now and their chart. So like I shared, all of them have majority of that stem. Epsilon, kappa, epsilon, iota, nu. All right? The only difference between the feminine and the masculine neuter is that final stem vowel, that omicron. Okay? So that's 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 the that's the demonstrative for pronouns. Oops. Sorry, sorry. All right, any questions? I'm going to sneeze right. I lost it, so that's unfortunate. Um, but, okay, if there's no questions, we're going to finish up for the day. Okay, I still need to teach you guys relative pronouns as well as the interrogative and de indefinite pronouns. Let's not worry about that. We'll talk about that next week. Okay, so now we'll finish up the class showing you what you got to do for next week. Okay, so give me one second so that I can put up Smoodle here.